Hi, I'm Scott McGregor. Welcome to Railway Adventures Across Australia. We're going to be travelling through a fair slice of this country, riding on some great trains and meeting some wonderful characters. Adventures usually start somewhere and that place is usually home. This is my home. So before we head off, I'd like to show you around. This little place is actually near Mudgee in central New South Wales. Now, you may be wondering why I'm so keen on old railway memorabilia. Well, it started way back when I was a kid. I was raising money one day from a scout troop. I was working at Orange Railway Station when a little steam locomotive rolled in. The driver leaned out of the window and said to me, Hey mate, you want to come up here and earn your money? So of course I joined him for the day. I got myself black all over from shoveling coal. When I went back to the scout master that night and showed him my card, he read it out to all the other boys. Driving a steam locomotive, one dollar. Well, from that moment on, I was hooked. Years later, when it came time to put a house on this place, I thought, what about an old railway carriage? And why not? They're big and roomy and full of character. You may be wondering how I got all these carriages up here. Well, this is how it was done. As you can see, it was all hands to the pump back then in 1990. The railways had a lot of old rolling stock lying around in those days that hadn't been used for years. So, although they looked a bit unloved, the stock I bought was all basically in pretty good condition. Not bad for a Pullman carriage that was originally built over 100 years ago. The excitement of getting that first carriage into place is something I'll never forget. At the end of the day, I was tired, but I was ecstatic. When the railway came to Australia, it really changed life. In a short space of time, we went from the horse and buggy to trains travelling long distances in previously unheard of time frames. It was a total revolution. In many ways, the railways are the history of Australia because they played such a big part in opening up this country. From about the middle of last century, trains took people to the gold fields. They helped the pioneers overcome their isolation and opened up the interior to wool and beef production not to mention the great wheat belts that are spread right across our nation. In short, the railway enabled our forebears to push the frontiers further and further out from the coastal cities to where the wealth and opportunities lay further inland. my place. But right now I think we better get going. We've got a lot of territory to cover. Hold tight, because there's going to be plenty to see and do on our railway adventures. Starting in Queensland. Far north Queensland and Cairns to be exact. From there, we'll work our way down south to the Gold Coast, with just a little detour out west to Longreach and the Barku country. 
But first, the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest marine park. This place is so big that when the explorer Captain Cook came here in 1770, he sailed inside the reef for days before he even suspected it was there. And he was no slouch as a navigator either. What's all this got to do with trains? We're here in Queensland for railway adventures, not coral adventures. But you can't come to Queensland without visiting the reef. So I thought I'd get this onerous task out of the way first. <laughs> Besides, there's no reason I can't talk about trains in a beautiful place like this. The history of rail in Queensland is a rich and colourful one and has played an important role in the development of the state. It's certainly the largest rail network in Australia, extending over more than 6,000 miles of track. In the early days, demand for railways in Queensland was high, but because of the vast distances involved and the small population, the railways had to be built very cheaply. For this reason, Queensland opted for the narrow or three foot six inch gauge. It was the first place in the world to adopt narrow gauge as a mainline railway. And it's given trains in Queensland a special character all of their own. Like our first journey on the Coranda Scenic Railway, one of the most beautiful railways in the world. Built between 1886 and 1891, it travels from Cairns on the coast up to Coranda on the edge of the Atherton Tablelands. The first stop on the line after Cairns is Freshwater Station. We'll get on board here. Over half a million people travel on this railway every year. It's the most popular one in the country, and you'll soon see why. From zero to a thousand feet above sea level, the train takes 90 minutes to journey through 15 hand-carved tunnels, dozens of bridges, and some spectacular scenery. At one point, we travel within feet of the Stony Creek Falls, our carriage suspended in the air on this fantastic trestle bridge. What an ideal tourist railway. And an engineering marvel. But it wasn't built as a tourist railway. They were unheard of in the 1880s. In those days, railways were built for hard-nosed commercial reasons. And they always took the cheapest and easiest route. If you look back into the history of the building of this railway, you'll find a bit of a scandal because the Cairns to Coranda route was not the cheapest or the easiest. To find out why this line was built, you've got to go right back to the big wet of 1882. Up on the Atherton Tableland, the tin miners were starving because supplies couldn't get through to them along the boggy track from Port Douglas. They began to agitate for a railway from the coast. Because there was an election coming up, the Polly said yes to the railway. Sound familiar? The Queensland Government Minister for Works commissioned Christy Palmerston, a legendary pioneer, to find a suitable route. The race was on. Both Port Douglas and Cairns formed railway leagues to begin a long and bitter fight for the right to build the railway. But not long after, Geraldton, soon to become Innisvale, joined in too. They couldn't get the government to employ Palmerston on their behalf, so they decided to employ him themselves through their own local council. During the year, Palmerston marked several possible routes from the coast, and the one he favoured most was the one from Geraldton. But the Geraldton council failed to pay him. So Palmerston refused to submit their route to the government surveyors. Instead, he only submitted the government-sponsored routes. And in March 1884, the line from Cairns to Coranda was announced the winner. Well, the screams of indignation from Port Douglas and Geraldton could be heard as far away as Brisbane. There were even suggestions of uh, incentives changing hands. Surely not in Queensland. But the people in Cairns were extremely happy. This big figure of rock here was left by the blokes who constructed the line as a memorial to all those who lost their lives in its building. It's called Rob's Monument. Construction was, and still is, considered a tremendous engineering feat. Built in three stages, hundreds of men worked on it and many lost their lives, especially on the perilous second stage up the mountain range. 
official records show that there were 23 deaths in all, but it's thought that many others went unrecorded as the steep slopes, fever and accidents with dynamite took their toll. Landslides also wrought havoc during construction. Forging the tunnels was a complex job in itself. And they did all this with buckets, dynamite and their bare hands. There were no jackhammers and bulldozers in those days, of course. Finally, in June 1891, after only five years, the Cairns to Coranda line was opened. Cairns prospered. These days, it's a vibrant international city, exuding the typical warm hospitality of the tropical north. At Port Douglas, trade dropped off rapidly after the railway was built, but these days, it enjoys a new lease of life as a popular tourist resort. Geraldton became Innisfail and prospered in its own right through the sugar industry. The Atherton Tablelands blossomed because now they had a reliable source of goods and freight. Coranda must be one of the most beautiful railway stations in the world. It's a pleasure simply to sit here for a while and take in the peaceful old world charm of the place. They're also very proud of their old 37 point signal box. So, Nev, this is the original box, eh? Yes, it is. It's been here, well, well over 100 years. All right, Scott, pull number 32. Neville Smith is the station master. He's going to show me how to set the road for the first down train back to Cairns. Get the signal to come off. Now, throw it back and try number 30. No, you can't, because... Now, all the rods and levers are interconnecting, that, stopping us from correct. doing anything wrong. That's, that's correct. And who said that built-in safety features were a modern invention? Foolproof, Neville says, looking at me. Set the points first. All right, we've now, set the points. Yep, watch a master at work. Through the yard, and now we'll make the signals. Right. Oh, I see, that's clear, that little repeater, yeah, too. That's clear, that's the little repeater, which is for the down-home signal, right out at the far end, the Mareeba end of the yard. The little repeaters are for the signals that can't be seen from the box itself. And there goes the first of the down trains for the day, safely on its way back to Cairns. And Coranda Town, well, for the most part, it remains a cool, sleepy little rainforest village, renowned for its resident artists. Except for when the train arrives. Then the many craft and souvenir shops spring into life at a moment's notice. One of the jewels of North Queensland is the World Heritage Daintree Rainforest. Once a part of a vast forest which covered the entire Australian continent. This mystical place is a rare survivor of 120 million years of climatic change. Change that has seen the forest reduced to just a few remaining areas on the continent. I've actually come up this way to do a bit of train work. We'll get to that a bit later. First, I want to take a look at the rainforest itself. And what better way to do it than through the eyes of its traditional custodians, the Kuku Yalanji people. This is Dawn Eri from the Mossman Gorge community. The tribal laws of Dawn's people are still handed down from generation to generation. And one of the strongest is the division between men and women's business. Okay, I want to show you this pool here, okay? Oh, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. This is, um, sorry, but this is for women only. Scott? Is it? Yes. I'm mm. sorry. Um, men have their pool. It's somewhere else. I no, don't know where it is, and I don't really want to know. Okay? So we're talking That's... about tribal law here? Yes, this is tribal law. Um, women have their things, men have their things, OK? And this is also a place where women would talk about business? Yes, and... this is where they come along and just be themselves and, and do, the, do what women do, chat. Hey, Scott, this is our strangler fig tree. Oh. 
Whoa, look at that. I'm doing this tree is extraordinary. It's estimated over 300 years old. It's always been here to our people. We climbed it and you can use it as a lookout point. They climb up there and they look out over the land and see who's coming. I've dreamed of living in places like that. <laughs> a tree house, yes. <laughs> the strangler fig is actually a parasite. It starts when seeds from bird droppings lodge in the upper branches of a host tree. The strangler slowly grows downward, winding its way around until it kills the host tree altogether. And this tree sacred to your people? Yes. Yes, Do, it is. What meaning does it have? Or? There's a um, story here, but only the men know this story. OK? OK. And that's the way it is. These rules have survived for thousands of years among Storm's people, and they're still important to their way of life today. Once the forest stretched right down to the ocean. These days, much of the coastal land has been given over to sugarcane. Mossman is a major centre for the sugar industry. It's also the home of some of the hardest working little trains in the country. The mill have agreed to let me ride on their trains for the day. But the privilege has come at a price. I've actually got to earn my keep and put in a day's work. They drive a hard bargain up here, these northerners. G'day, you George? That's right. I'm Scott. Apparently I'm assigned to you today, is that right? That's correct. <laughs> I'm up. Great, come on. George is a local with an interesting pedigree. His grandfather came from the West Indies and his mum's a Thursday Islander with a little bit of German blood mixed in for good measure. He reckons Mossman is the best place in the world to live. I think this is undoubtedly the prettiest part of the world that I've seen. And here you are amongst it every day, driving out into the hills yeah, like this. Very, very lucky. This vest here, yeah. it's all climbing this regulation, I've got to wear those vests. Brand new too. Brand new. Look at that. Top stuff. This is so I can look just like you, Darcy. Yeah. Darcy is George's regular fireman, and I suspect that right now he's planning a pretty easy day for himself. Got a point here, so pull up. I'll get you to change those points. All right. Just check the blades to make sure that when you do change it, there's no rocks between the blades. Yes, George. Actually, he's got a good reason for saying that. If a rock jams between these rails, it could derail the train, and that'd be the end of my career as a fireman, I'd suspect. getting the hang of it. It's amazing the power a red vest can bring to a bloke, isn't it? This reminds me of my days with a scout troop when I was a kid. Sugarcane is really just an oversized member of the grass family. Once upon a time, they used to burn the crop before harvesting, but now they let the leaves stay on the ground because it's better for the soil. Our job is to make sure the mill is constantly supplied with cane. During the harvesting season, which is from mid-June to September, the mill and these little trains go for 24 hours a day until the entire crop is in. There's a maze of track that winds its way through the cane fields from the mill, so the whole operation is very efficient. Before you finish, mate. Oh, he's a slave driver, this bloke? Yes. Could you take us up the waivers and give the traffic controller, please? My pleasure, mate. I've had a top day. Good on you. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thanks, Once at the mill, the cane is weighed, tested for its sugar content, and crushed to release the sugar juice. The juice is then evaporated until the crystals of raw sugar form and grow. The milling process is very efficient. 
just about every piece of the cane is used, including the cane fibre, which fires the boilers in the plant. The original Mossman mill was built in 1857. And looking at this crushing gear, you'd be excused for thinking that they're still using some of the original equipment. No matter how old some of this gear may be, though, it must still work OK, because the original mill was designed to crush 25 tonnes of cane per hour, and at present, the mill handles about 475 tonnes per hour. Sweet figures in any person's language. I get the feeling these efficient little trains are going to be around hauling sugar cane for a long time to come. And I reckon George is right. There aren't too many places in the world where you can work in such a beautiful place as this. Time to be moving on. I'm booked on the Sunlander, heading south. Next stop, Townsville. The Sunland is just one of two or three trains that run up and down the coast from Brisbane to Cairns. Queensland's well served by its rail network, not just on the coast, but inland as well. Townsville, home of the Great South Pacific Express. But before we get to Australia's most luxurious train, let's have a look around Townsville. Standing guard over the city is the imposing landmark of Castle Hill. This is Australia's largest tropical city, with a population of 135,000 people. The city itself is a blend of old and new. Ross Creek an offshoot of the Ross River, is a safe anchorage for the fishing trawlers and charter boats that provide ferry services and diving expeditions to the Great Barrier Reef. This train looks like an elegant survivor from last century. But she's not. The Great South Pacific Express is brand new. And she's about to become one of the world's great trains, travelling along the eastern seaboard of Australia. And it's been a very interesting evolution for this hotel on wheels. These are the Queensland Rail Townsville workshops, where the train is being built. Looking at these sheds now, it's hard to believe that not long ago, they were in serious danger of being closed down, unless a new project could be found. The idea to build a world-class heritage train was a bold one, but it's worked. Looking at this place now, it's a hive of activity. The brief was to create a world-class luxury train in the style of the late Victorian era. But the designers also had to include the mod cons of today. Things like air conditioning, telephone, faxes and cappuccino machines. Denise Corcoran, the interior designer of the train, is no stranger to railway carriages. She was involved with the design of two of our other great trains, the GAN and the Indian Pacific. But this train, she says, is different. What's especially interesting about this train is that it was designed from scratch. And in order to come up with a design, you've had to study all sorts of antique carriages? Yes, we looked at uh, trains interstate, several carriages interstate, and we also looked into the archives in Queensland Rail. In the beginning, they did try rebuilding old carriages, but it didn't work because there was no room for all the wiring and ducting. And the wooden frames of the old carriages weren't strong enough either. So they scrapped the idea and built the carriages from the ground up using solid steel frames. Each of these cars is a masterpiece of craftsmanship. 
Many skills of the past have been revived. The detailing of the pressed metal ceilings, for example, is an old skill relearned by the carriage painters. The interior walls are fashioned from the finest Queensland red cedar and Tasmanian myrtle. In the old days, railway companies indulged in very distinctive liveries. The final touch, the crest. This is Queensland Railway's crest, very ornate. Whoever said the romance has gone from train travel? There hasn't been a train like this built in the past 50 years. This is Australia's answer to the Orient Express, the Royal Scotsman and all the other world-class luxury trains. Except I reckon this one is even better. But then again, I may be a bit biased. leaving the Sunlander here at Rockhampton because I want to head out west to Longreach. To do that, I've got to catch the spirit of the outback. This is the big detour I've been talking about. The spirit of the outback actually originates in Brisbane. I've met the train halfway along its journey. The full trip is 24 hours. But for us, it's only a 12 hour journey through some pretty interesting outback country. I'm heading out west because I know about an interesting little branch line train. There aren't many branch line services left anywhere in Australia now, and this one's under threat of closure. That's why I think it may be worth taking a look at now. Longreach is about 750 miles from Brisbane. It was settled in the 1870s and is now the largest town in the central west of Queensland. Longreach is also the home of the Stockman's Hall of Fame and the very first home of Qantas, our national airline. We're now heading about 140 miles south of Longreach to a sheep station called Albilba. The branch line train passes right by this property at a place called Ungo Siding. The area is known as the Baku country after the Baku River, the major waterway in this region. Recently the drought broke and the pastoralists are enjoying conditions they haven't seen for years. Here the countryside looks good. So does the stock. All due to the recent rains, of course. We just played havoc with the road. It's just as well they've got a railway line, I'd say. Whoa, emus. A whole flock of them. Gee, they look healthy. The kangaroos too. It's a cornucopia of Australian fauna here on the roadside. It's all come down here for the green pig. Here we are, Albilba Homestead, my destination. I know the people who run this place, you see. The branch line train comes by on a Wednesday, which happens to be today. So I should be able to catch up with it. Scotty, down at the sheep yards, Bill. Man, a few words our Bill. Beautiful homestead, this one. Bill Parkinson runs about 12,000 head of sheep on our Bilba. By the look of all these sheep in the yards, he must be selling a few. Or maybe shifting them down to Wandsworth, his other property. Well G'day, done. Scott. Well met. Hey. It's been a while. This is Bill. Likewise. Likewise. And this is his driving crew. This Annie. Morning, okay. Scott. Ladies first. Yeah. What do you do? Jack. And that's Jack. Jack. Yeah. John and Hawksy. You fellas get those sheep on that train by midday. All right, all right. 
consider it done. <laughs> this is a bit of good luck. Bill wants to put these sheep on Wandsworth, which is three days walk away. But he's decided to put them on the train, down as far as Yarraka first. It'll save a day's walk. This is a bit unlike Bill, you see, because he's not one to spend a dollar when it's not absolutely necessary. I don't mind, though. Gives me a good excuse to ride the train. The drovers are expert at this sort of work. Once upon a time, of course, this would have all been done on horseback. Now the bikes have taken over. The dog doesn't seem to mind, though, does he? Annie's actually a school teacher in real life, but she was brought up in the country and can handle a bike as well as the next bloke. Opening up the carriages now? Yeah, going up into the carriages. Now all run straight through, hopefully. Sheep are reluctant travellers at the best of times. Just to help things along a bit, Hawks ties one up inside the first wagon in the hope that it'll encourage the others to follow. The job still proves to be hard work though. It takes a woman's touch in the end. Yeah, it's hot work, this. Bill's wife, Margaret Ann, is a welcome oh, sight, carrying right. fresh, cool. juicy oranges, oh, straight from the homestead's orchard. Beautiful. Well, the line might be under threat of closure, but that still doesn't stop the train from running on time. 12 o'clock, right on the button. It's a slow trip down to Yarraka, I'm told. And just looking at the kinks in the line, you can understand why, can't you? The track doesn't sit on a bed of stones or ballast, like on busier lines. The sleepers and rails simply lie on top of the earth, so the train has to take things pretty slowly. This is what they call the driver's van, eh? <laughs> Once upon a time, Trains similar to this one ran all over Australia. This was in the days before road transport took over. They were called mixed trains then, and they serviced the farms, mines and small towns that lay off the mainline routes. They carried everything from supplies, livestock to people. The people usually travelled in a carriage right at the end of the train, before the guard's van. Our destination, Yarraka, is one of the most remote communities in the whole Baku region. It's little more than a school, a policeman and a pub. The people in this tiny town rely on the once weekly train for their supplies and their survival particularly in the wet, when you can't even get out in a four-wheel drive. There's no sealed airstrip in town either, so it's either helicopter or the train. The loss of this train could well break up this community. I, I don't think it would be the straw that would break the camel's back for the town because, uh, see, there's only ten kids at school at the moment. Like, only five families have kids at the school. So the school might go? Well, there's uh, two of the families are from the railway line. So if the railway line went bang, you've only got three families that have kids at the school. All right. That school's on shaky ground now. So if the railway line goes, then a school could go. Only a few of these little local services are left in Queensland, and who knows for how long. 
They certainly don't carry passengers anymore. We were lucky today, I guess. These cows seem to think they own the town already. And I don't think they're too keen to let us in somehow. This is us, guys. Hey. We're here. Yep. I'll tell you, they're happy about coming off, aren't they, Annie? I would be too. <laughs> You're not wrong there. All the day's work. Oh, my pleasure, Annie. So, look, you guys are on the road to Wandsworth. Yep. With these sheep. And, uh,. I'm the lucky one that goes off to the pub and catches the train again tomorrow. You get that? I'll go to the pub any time. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, good on you. Time to leave our friends in the Baku country and head back to Rockhampton. From there, we're going to travel south once again to Gympie and visit the mighty Mary Valley Rattler. Some of the old branch lines survive through institutions like this one, commonly known as rail or steam heritage societies. The Mary Valley Rattler runs every Sunday along the old Mary Valley branch line, from Gympie to Imble and back. The people who keep these trains running are usually all dedicated volunteers. They invest a lot of their own time and labour into it and take the job very seriously even down to wearing the correct railway uniforms of the period. We're looking at early 1900s here, around World War I, which was about the time this line was opened. Now, when I say the people who work on these railways take their jobs very seriously, I should clarify this. These blokes, and women too, I think some of them have more fun than they dare to admit. Oh, Ken. Scott. You like playing trains? I've got a big train set, mate. <laughs> no one can argue with that. <laughs> no. But look, you're all in the garb. I love the I pit know. helmet. That's so as people can take the pit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now we're talking about it. What carriage have you got me in? Sorry, Scott, you haven't booked. We're full. You're kidding, you've got five carriages here. I know, but you should have booked earlier. You're that popular. That popular. The only way you can see the train today is to go by car. No doubt about it, they take it seriously with all these crossing guards with their red flags, green flags, and bells. A quick history lesson here. The Mary Valley Line came into being in 1914 in order to supply the gold mining town of Gympie with timber and farm produce from the fertile Mary Valley. That's the end of this lesson. Now, if that's not an idyllic rural setting, Magic, pure magic. On its 30 mile return trip, the train passes through some spectacular countryside natural scrub, pasture land, and pineapple plantations. Top spot. An excellent photo opportunity. Oh. It's an occupational hazard talking to yourself. Train buffs are renowned for it.
got to imagine yourself 40 or 50 years ago, waiting to catch the train home or something. Excellent, excellent. Next stop, let's have a look at this. Kandanga. Kandanga Station, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to get off. We'll be here for approximately 10 minutes. It's a beautiful line. Yeah. Yes, you get some beautiful views across the valleys. You miss it on the road because you're down the bottom of the valley. But yeah. We run round it halfway up the hill most of the way. We are Dagen. There is a seat still left. Here we are, he's pulled off right up at the dog box now. Ken could have invited me to go into the dog box. Beauty, classic Queenslander. Gimpy Station. Each heritage society has something different to offer. I think the charm of the Mary Valley Rattler is the sheer enthusiasm of the people who run it. That and the entertainment to be had on the way. So, even though I didn't get to ride on the train, I still had a great day. Ipswich is the birthplace of rail in Queensland and this little beauty has been a part of the scene here right from the very beginning. She's the A10 class locomotive, number six, and she's one of the oldest operating steam locomotives in the world. She was built in 1865. Pretty special. Number six was actually the eighth locomotive to enter service in Queensland. She was built in Glasgow by Scottish engineering firm Nielsen and Company. She was then shipped out to Australia where she began work on the 20th of August, 1866. Roy is the custodian of number six for today. He loves the sheer simplicity of this engine, not to mention the open air driver's platform. All round air conditioning, perfect for the Queensland climate. A typical train for number six in the old days would have been several small four wheeled goods wagons, a couple of passenger carriages, perhaps a horse box and a guards van.
and there's no rest for the old age diver. Number six still pulls special excursion trains on a regular basis. And from all accounts, she's doing a fine job too. This is the Rosewood Railway Museum, not far from Ipswich. I'm looking for one of the drivers here, Bob Peze. We met about 10 years ago when I worked on a TV series and he supplied the trains. Hey, Bob. How are you? Oh, a long time no see. Yeah, mate. it's been a while. Yeah, it's been quite a while. Now, listen, Bob, I'm dying to talk to you about what's involved in actually getting a show like this up and running. What, like, what time did you get here this morning? Oh, I got here at 5.30, and uh, the locomotive's got to be checked to make sure it's fit to run. Uh, you go around and you've got to set your fire, light it, and then you oil the loco. It takes about an hour and a half to oil the loco, and then by about 9, 9.30, you've got enough steam up to move the locomotive. Probably five hours of work before you open the gates to the putters. That's right. So, Bob, what's in it for you? I mean, why do you do it? Well, the sheer and utter enjoyment of it. To leave things for the future generations and, uh, well, every little boy wants to be an engine driver, doesn't that's he? That's true, that's true. Mm. And this is the train Bob supplied, Red Fred. And by all accounts, Fred's a bit of a beast to drive. You see, Red Fred is actually a big diesel motor on rails, not unlike a truck, except Fred has a pretty basic kind of gearbox, as Roy Walton is about to show us. Put on the clutch, wait for the gears to stop the spinning, and then select the first gear. Release brakes. You can then give it a bit of throttle. It's certainly not the smooth synchro mesh type box that allows the driver of a modern truck to change gears with ease. Clutch! And a double your clutch. To get them in, the driver has to double declutch the gears at every change. It's a pretty skillful job, requiring spot on timing. Imagine doing this all day 50 years ago when Fred was at his peak. Red Fred, or RM55, was built in 1938. We're travelling along part of Rosewood's old northern branch line. A rare 1920s wing-wang signal. There's only two or three of this type left in the whole country. I wouldn't mind that one in my collection. If nothing else, Queensland's a land of contrasts. From the barrier reef and the tropical rainforests to the Baku country and the vast inland. And now this, the Miami-like skyline of the Gold Coast. You don't need to guess where I feel most at home. And you know, just down the end of the beach there, New South Wales. But that's another story. See you then.